Good evening ladies and gentlemen and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar, IET webinar, IET Sussex webinar and uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce this this evening but before I do that uh, on behalf of IET Sussex we're particularly um, grateful to our member uh, Ramon Tambos for organising this speaker and we'll come on to that in, in, a, in a minute so that's uh, uh, I'm here as a bit of a fraud but anyway let's go on uh, so with no more ado I would like to uh, actually find a piece of paper I'd like to introduce the speaker and Christian Perial worked the last 32 years within ABB at different positions as sales manager business developer medium voltage switch gear, high voltage substations, power electronic solutions for power, uh, for power systems and industrial applications and uh, especially power quality solutions for electric arch furnaces as well and lately for synchronous condensers that's what we'll hear about. His background is electrical power engineering and he studied at the College of Power System Engineering, or a College of Power System Engineering in Austria. I can't read exactly which it was, so if you want to tell uh, everybody, Christian, it's up to you. And he's written and presented general papers at uh, SARED, SIGRE, and IEEE conferences and WIN conferences. He's a current member of ongoing SIGRE working group and I won't read that out, but working on guidelines for synchronous um, condenser specifications at the moment. And Christian is very kindly um, actually Zooming from his hotel in Spain. So fingers crossed that all goes well. And over to you now, Christian. I'm going to stop my share and I'm going to ask you to put your share up and uh, start the proceedings. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so first the tone is coming uh, and then we will have the screen as well. So I hope uh, everybody can see the screen uh, and uh, so long you can also maybe see my, uh, my video. I will take that away from a while uh, because to secure that my connection uh, is uh, good so that at least you can hear the messages with my slides. So thank you very much uh, to having me uh, and I hope that I can give you a kind of nice uh, and good information about synchronous condensers and why they are becoming so important just now. Uh, the reason why I'm sitting in Spain is because I'm participating on the Wind Europe conference so uh, it's uh, again about renewables and that is also the background for the reasons of the synchrons, but I will come back to that. So uh, let's go on. So uh, uh, I also show you here some email addresses. So if uh, after the Q&A sessions, if there are some left uh, questions from your side, feel free in contacting me. Uh, it's uh, it's perfect to, to uh, uh, ask questions or come with comments or whatever. I also gave here some some uh, links uh, to additional material which may be of interest for you to to read about. Uh, the starting point will be regarding synchronous condensers, the the the, the W's, the what's, the why, the when, where, and and who is investing in synchronous condensers. Um, and then I will go into a little bit in our project, which we have done uh, not only in UK, but also abroad in Australia, Canada and other places. Uh, a little bit of specialities about uh, high inertia solution uh, and also a, a, a summary on that. So a uh, synchronous condenser, what, what is that? Uh, well, a synchronous condenser, it's a, a rotating machine. Uh, it's not a motor because there is no load connected to it, no, no at least no mechanical load. It's not a generator because there is no driver connected it, uh, no gas turbine or whatever kind of turbine. 
uh, driving the machine. So it's in reality, it's a, it's a, a rotating machine, which is once it's connected to the grid and synchronized to the grid and uh, connected, uh, it provides services, which are the ones which are of interest uh, in the power system. And that is in reality, you can put them together in this uh, more or less three words, inertia, fault level contribution and reactive power MVRs. So uh, how we are doing it uh, with uh, ABP and which is a, a quite nice solution to, to uh, uh, connect, uh, to handle a synchronous condenser is we have a main machine, which is in reality the synchronous condenser, which via a circuit breaker will be connected to the grid. But of course, when the machine stands still, you have to speed it up. Uh, and this is done uh, with a pony motor and uh, a frequency drive, which is connected to the pony motor. So first we are running up the machine to a synchronous speed, uh, based on the fact that we are using permanent magnet generators on our synchronous condensers, we are also providing the auxiliary power supply to the excitation system. So we are in that respect uh, independent from, from the uh, auxiliary power supplies because uh, once we are up running and with some speed, we are generating our uh, uh, auxiliary power. And with that, we can also control our oxidation system. So once then we are running on the synchronous speed, so in most cases, uh, when we have a, a four pole machine, this means uh, 1,500 RPMs. Uh, this is the, the, the selection of the synchronous condenser speed, which we have done at least for the IEC market. Then we are checking uh, if the, the synchronous condenser can be synchronized to the grid within am with amplitude and, uh, and uh, frequency and uh, uh, phase angle. And then we are synchronizing with the closing the breaker to the grid so that it will be uh, the synchronous condenser then connected to the grid and is running synchronous with the, 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 the power system. And in reality, then the, the synchronous condenser is fit for fight. That means that then we are able in providing the MVRs, that means reactive power in supporting the grid. Uh, we are there in providing inertia in case that there is uh, frequency variations. And uh, we are providing fault current contribution in case there is a fault in the grid, which needs uh, a fault current support. So, so why are these uh, synchronous condensers are becoming so important just now? Well, the, the reason behind that is our common goal that we are trying to re reduce our CO2 emissions. And uh, with this goal, this means automatically that uh, our conventional power plants like uh, coal-fired power plants or gas turbines are decommissioned or disconnected from the grid. Uh, to reduce the CO2 emissions. And uh, in some cases, even uh, we, we saw that uh, countries are disconnecting nuclear power plants because they are not anymore uh, fitting into our uh, environmental ideas of, uh, of uh, uh, re renewable uh, power support and power supply. And this means in reality that all these type of power plants, which I call now conventional power plants, are uh, not connected to the grid anymore and the services which these power plants provided is not there. That means there is less rotating mass because the, all those type of power plants are providing rotating mass uh, based on the generators connected. All those uh, big power plants with these big generators are also providing fault current and fault current contribution. And if those, of course, are replaced by uh, renewable uh, generation, which means wind or solar is the majority, then uh, those type of renewable power plants are not good in providing inertia. They are not good in providing a, a fault current support because they are power electronic interfaced. 
very shortly. Uh, so with that, automatically, we are seeing more and more weaker grids. And weaker grids, uh, you can see in your homes when the, the, the voltage are getting dips, you, uh, industries are losing their frequency converters, are tripping off, maybe your lights are even uh, going, out, uh, going off. Uh, we have seen these type of cases also in UK uh, about two years ago in, in, in October, August or September it was, where uh, you had these blackouts in a uh, big part of, of uh, England uh, caused by this uh, lightning strike and the, the disconnection of uh, offshore wind farm. Uh, and of course, these, these uh, weaknesses in the grid are then of course, uh, we have to avoid, and to avoid that, you have to look for solutions. Uh, and one of those solutions is synchronous condensers, which is a known technology and uh, a technology was which was used in reality in the 50s, 60s, 70s, when there was no power electronics. But then uh, it was replaced a little bit uh, in providing reactive power by power electronics. And now it's the other way back. Now the power electronics are, uh, uh, they cannot provide these type of services, not, they cannot provide these type of strengths like fault currents. And that's the reason why the synchronous condensers are coming back. And this is uh, uh, quite a big uh, challenge uh, for the power system operators like the N National Grid ESO or for other power operators, transmission system operators, all over the world. I will come back to that. Of course, there are also other type of solutions which are tried and tested uh, when it comes to grid forming inverters and power electronics where you could add on some type of battery and some energy storage. But it, it, finally, you, you end up in the, in the basic question, when you have a power electronic, you are not as good in providing fault currents. Uh, just basic, based on the fact that power electronics are defined for a certain uh, nominal current. And uh, if you would like to provide a fault current, which is five or six times the nominal current, then uh, you cannot do that easily with the power electronics. But for the machine, this is a natural way of working. Now, uh, when we look on the, on the traditional grid, uh, it was always that the big power plants were connected on a transmission system and then the, the grid was split down to uh, regional se se uh, segments in the grid, regional networks and down to the low voltage networks. And it was a kind of top-down approach. Now, uh, with more and more renewables and uh, uh, coming in both as solar as well as wind, you can see those uh, renewable power plants are connecting nowadays at the transmission level, but also in the distribution network, which means that power flows are, are uh, changing. Uh, it's, uh, you will see this power, power electronic uh, interfaced uh, power generation in each and every area. Uh, and this uh, means that the, the, the setup of the, of the grid looks more like on the right-hand side, like the future grid. Even so, uh, <laughs> I don't like this picture so much because we are still living with the transmissional, transmission segment grid structure. It's only that it looks like that those uh, new renewable power plants are interconnecting more. But in reality, we have still the existing transmission lines and uh, transmission network. What you see, and uh, if you do this comparison, what is changing? Well, before it was a strong grid with a high fault level, with high uh, short circuit ratio, which was sh telling you how strong a grid is. Now, this grid is getting weaker because of this renewables are connecting there and replacing uh, you can say the conventional power plants. And with that automatically, this short circuit ratio is going down. Now, uh, with the short circuit ratio, it's going down. This is also interfering even the power electronics because the, also the power electronics are dependent on a, a strong grid because uh, if you would like to control the power electronics, they need also be uh, the, the voltage phaser or the, 
the the you can say the the uh, the way that you can control your your uh, firing of the power electron it is depending on the on a stable voltage but if the voltage is not stable because of the weak grid uh, and the low fault level then uh, you have a problem also with the, the 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 firing and the control of your power electronics so that's the reason why uh, these synchronous condensers are becoming more and more important because they are adding spinning mass, they are adding fault level uh, in each and every uh, place, network place where they are connected. And uh, so now, if I want to shortly describe a little bit what are the typical uh, requirements for or or uh, advantages of a synchronous condenser. Yo, of course, first of all, it's the inertia, it's the rotating mass. And uh, you know, when you have a synchronous machine, it could be a, a conventional synchronous generator, but also synchronous condensers, of course, they are electromechanically linked to the power system. How you can see that on the, the left hand side. Now, excuse me that this is 60 hertz mentioning there. I've used and, and stolen that that picture from a, a, a presentation from us but it's very much nicely showing you that this electromechanical interconnection of the synchronous machines and they are sitting there good together and if there is for some reason a frequency variation caused by a trip of a transmission line or trip of a a, a power plant then this frequency of the whole grid will go down or go up and the inertia will of those all those synchronous machines will flow into the grid or consume inertia or megawatt seconds from the grid in case there is an over frequency on the network. Because in the in, in the, the idea, of course, for national grid ESO is to have a balance, as you see in the middle. And this balance to keep the frequency balance is not anymore so easy because you have on one side the demand side, and this is varying, uh, and you, ha you have your variations there. And on the other side, you have the supply side, the power generation side, and also there, uh, wind and solar uh, and general power generation are also getting more and more fluctuation. So uh, the, the, the task for national grid ESO, it's not so easy to keep that constant. So of course, if you would like to, to handle it in a smooth way, then it's a synchronous condenser is quite a smart device because you don't need power, you don't need any type of control. It's purely of the electromechanical connection of the machine and the, the, the situation that he sees the frequency variation, he provides you the inertia. And this is, uh, I would say, a typical smart grid device. Uh, there is a lot of words discussed about something which is called Rokov or rate of change of frequency. And, uh, and of course, the more uh, frequency change you get, uh, for, because you, let's, let's say, trip a big power plant, you will get also more inertia from the rotating machines connected. So there is a direct link between the inertia provided by the machines and the rate of change of frequency, which, which you would get if there is a fault in the network. Now, if you look on non-synchronous generation or this typical renewable generations like wind, solar, uh, tidal, energy storage, uh, these type of devices, they are uh, power electronic interfaced. And this means that they, first of all, they need a, a, a um, a control functionality to which is supervising that there is first of all they have to measure or see that there is a frequency change and then based on that they would like to counteract somehow and there are developments going on to do that but in any case it's a kind of uh, a software interaction uh, and it's that means in reality well if even the software is uh, clever and, and uh, smart, it's, it's still, uh, you need time to realize what is going on in the grid, especially if, you, if the grid has, has a fault, because then you may get uh, uh, frequency swings, 
you may have uh, harmonics coming into the picture, uh, which are our phase jumps, which makes uh, frequency measurements and and uh, to un understanding of what's going on in the grid not so easy. So uh, what is simple for the synchronous machines could be quite so big task for the power electronic devices. And that's the reason why uh, big uh, uh, system, transmission system operators like uh, synchronous condensers because of this uh, natural electrical mechanical link to the grid. Now, if you go to the, to the second big issue, which is uh, creating a headache uh, for transmission system operators, and that is fault current contribution. Now, uh, I always get the question, what is the reason that we need a fault current? Well, it's very simple. Uh, if you in your home, you have fuses, uh, and if uh, those fuses are not there, you have no protection that in case you are uh, getting a fault in the network that you are not, uh, so that you can, uh, you, you are not protected uh, and uh, you have nothing which is protecting uh, property or life. And it's the same thing uh, with, uh, with uh, in the trans transmission system and distribution system. You need uh, a fault current provide, uh, which is provided uh, from somewhere. Now, if, if you have a rotating machine, uh, you get normally a, a fault current contribution when there is a fault, which is very smart again, based on the reactances of the machine itself and the time constants related to that. That means in reality that in the beginning, the fault current is very high and then it stems down to a continuous steady state uh, current. And this takes a, more than a second uh, to come down to this steady state uh, value, up, even up to 10 seconds, if you like, when we are looking into this field forcing uh, issue uh, where we can increase the, the, the current which is provided from the machine. Now, uh, and, and this uh, first instantaneous action from the, if you have a fault, the contribution of the machine, as I said, it's automatically, just purely physically uh, created by the reactances of the, of the machine, as the machine is a part of the grid in reality. If you're looking on the, on the picture on the right hand side on the, the, on the below, there, this is a typical fault current of a power electronic device, which can provide you a fault current, which is maybe in a maximum up to a two times the rated world value, but normally you're limited rather to 1.2. So it's slightly above the nominal value. And of course you can imagine that if you would like to start a, a transformer with an inrush current, or if you would like to operate an arc furnace, uh, it will not so easy to be handled, to, 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 that you can handle that if your power generation is 100% based on renewables, because you don't have those fault current contribution from those devices. So that's the big advantage with the synchronous condensers, uh, which are providing then this fault current. Now, uh, you can say that, well, under transmission system, we don't need so much fault current. Uh, there, uh, we have uh, protection schemes, uh, impedance protection, so there is no high fault current required, but it's not true. It's, it is required. Uh, also in the transmission system, there are studies done per national grid showing the, 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 the requirements of fault currents, not only in the transmission system, but also in the distribution networks. That means lower down in the, in the regional networks and even in the medium voltage networks. And definitely in the medium voltage networks, you will never have the possibility to use a modern uh, impedance protection, which uh, would you allow you to uh, reduce the fault current, you can say. So uh, uh, in those cases, uh, in, in media voltage, uh, in the most cases you have overcurrent protections, which are the state of the art uh, protection relays. And if there is no overcurrent, you have no protection. So that's the reason why synchronous condensers are used not only in the transmission network, but we will see more and more synchronous condensers also in the distribution network. That means in the media voltage networks, uh, lower down the line in the power grid. 
Now, to the third point, when we are looking into the, the functionalities of asynchronous condensers, we can provide uh, reactive power dynamically. That means that we can control the reactive power which we are providing or consuming from the grid. And what do that mean? Well, this means in reality, uh, reactive power means uh, voltage regulation. Uh, and uh, uh, so you will see here on the, in, on the screen, a typical uh, uh, compatibility diagram of a generator uh, where the red lines, uh, so this is a generator with its uh, 14 uh, MVA, MVA machine, which on the right, on the, on the X axel would be the active power and on the Y axel would be the reactive power. Uh, which you could take out of that machine. And that in reality, uh, the red lines are defining the limits of this generator. And you can see that uh, there are operating points only in the, in, in the middle, or you can say on the uh, above the, the, the X axle, where you could get the operating point of a generator. Now for a synchronous condenser, the operating region is only at the blue line that you can only control the reactive power uh, which you are consuming, and then we are lowering the voltage in the grid, or that we are pro producing reactive power, or, or from the machine side, we have we are around the machine overexcited, then we are lifting the power in the power grid uh, and supporting the grid in the power grid. Uh, so, and that is becoming very important as well. Uh, now, of course, also there, there are other type of devices which can provide reactive power, but it's a, a natural way for synchronous contentions to provide reactive power dynamically. They are not as quick as power electronics, but uh, nowadays people are thinking more in the direction is if you have too many devices which are very quick, you may also get interactions between those devices and this, this can create a headache. Uh, for the ones who should control a voltage on a certain limit if those devices are extremely quick. So it's a, a synchronous condenser is maybe not as quick as power electronics, but can deliver the, the reactive power in a dynamic way. And that's the important thing. And without a lot of oscillations and, uh, and uh, problems to the grid. Now, uh, I put a slide here, which I, I only will, uh, speak a, a little bit about, depending on the, the type of uh, industry or customer you are, you may have different type of problems where the synchronous condenser can support you. Now, of course, for renewables and HVD ceilings, uh, the, the majority of those, as I mentioned to you before, they are power electronics device or interface devices. And those normally require this uh, uh, a fault level contribution uh, at the connection point of those devices, even those HVD links, because they need this uh, fault level for controlling the power electronics. And that's what, what PLL stands for. It means phase lock loop control, where you are securing that the, the, the control of the power electronics is, can be done in a good way because if this phase lock loop is stable, then the control of the power electronics is stable. And, and that is one issue for this power electronics device. They need the fault current and the synchronous condensers can provide it. Now, if you take a look uh, as an example for the transmission system, I said already the real protection issue is an important issue, but also power quality is an important issue. Now, as you understand, uh, fault level transmission system are not only there for providing a fault current. They are also there to limiting the, the uh, power quality uh, emissions in the grid. Let's say that you have a, a, a big uh, renewable uh, wind farms or solar farms, and those inverters and converters are switching uh, depending on their uh, the, the sun and the and the wind uh, they are generating, and based on this switching of the power electronics, they will create harmonics, uh, voltage harmonics and current harmonics, and the only way to limit those is with higher fault level. 
So that means in reality, you can say a fault level is also a security that you don't get uh, flick issues, that you don't get higher harmonics in the grid. And if we have more and more harmonics in the grid, those uh, uh, our more power electronics connected to the grid, we, more uh, harmonics we will get. Uh, and it's only the question of in which uh, range if, and which uh, frequency range the, the harmonics are. If they are in the lower frequency harmonic range or in the higher frequency or harmonic range, but it's, it's, they are not good in, in any case. Uh, when it comes to industry, one of the big problems for those is uh, that they are running more and more also their own motors, uh, their synchronous motors and synchronous machines with frequency drives. That means also the industry has reduced these additional fault currents, which they have normally uh, had for free by, by the motors connected to their grid. But now by reducing the, the, the losses, more and more frequency drives are connecting those motors to their grid. And those frequency drives are also sensitive to voltage dips. So that means if there is a voltage dip coming from the grid, this could create for the industry the headache that they are uh, uh, seeing this voltage dip as too deep, uh, which means that they will trip off the, the process. And of course, you can imagine what that costs for the process industry if, uh, if you trip off because of a, a voltage dips coming from the network or created by a starting of a big machine. So wh where can you then connect synchronous condensers? Now, I, I mentioned to you in, in the beginning of, the, of this synchronous condenser area, I can say the, the most and the, the first ones who were really thought about that were the transmission system operator. That means uh, a, a lot of synchronous condensers are connected to the transmission grid. Uh, directly on the transmission grid, like for example, in this uh, project we see now in UK, with this pathfinder of uh, projects, I will come back to that, or in connection with renewables, uh, or in connection with existing power plants where they use the existing infrastructure and connect uh, synchronous condensers. We also see more and more synchronous con condensers which are connecting to the industry to help the industry uh, to keep the fault level high. To, to secure that they are not running into problems when they see a voltage dip from the network, because we will see more voltage dips based on the change uh, from uh, conventional power generation to uh, renewable. We will see more voltage dips and voltage variations and even frequency variations. Now, asynchronous condensers can help and protect the industry, uh, especially a good example of a typical example about that is mining industry which very often are in the, in the remote end of the, of the grid, where we have weak, uh, low fault levels, and with that automatically, the risk of voltage dips are bigger. But we have also seen now more and more synchronous condensers connecting to the, to the medium voltage network and the distribution grid, because also there, the, the distribution grid are uh, getting weaker, uh, some cases uh, they would like to run distribution grids even as uh, uh, independent uh, power islands where they get their uh, renewables uh, providing the active power. But then uh, when they disconnect from the grid, there is nobody provide the fault current. <laughs> so they need synchronous contenders improving that, providing the fault current in these islands, power islands or, or load islands, you can say. Uh, and uh, helping uh, in uh, keeping the voltage stable and keeping uh, the, the fault current available so that the protection system can run in a normal way. Uh, now to these uh, examples, I have uh, international projects. I speak about three countries. First, a little bit about uh, uh, national grid, very shortly about uh, Australia and uh, Spain as uh, how they are thinking in this respect of uh, applying synchronous condenser in the grid. But let's go to UK first. Now, uh, National Grid ESO has started up uh, with this stability pathfinder projects. Uh, the first project was, uh, I think, uh, two and a half years, three years ago before, where they announced that. 
uh, where they asked for uh, additional inertia, especially uh, in, in the, across the whole Britain. And this was in reality a project which was uh, pinpointed for rotating machines, uh, where they wanted old uh, conventional power plants uh, to uh, move over to be synch becoming synchronous contenders. Now, uh, in reality, uh, some of those uh, were also uh, converted to synchronous condensers. Um, uh, now I have uh, forgot the names of those uh, uh, plants, but they, I, I could come back to that and can provide you some data about that. But also they bought also a number of uh, synchronous condensers uh, providing inertia, this means rotating mass into the grid, which is helping to, to secure and provide time for national grid ESO to control the frequency in a better way. Then the next, and, and there in the first phase, uh, ABP was also successful together with uh, Stubcraft, uh, where we have one project, which, which is called Lister Drive, uh, where we delivered the synchronous contenders with flywheel, uh, which is uh, additionally providing this inertia, uh, even with a additional rotating mass, which we call flywheel. The next project, which is just now ongoing, uh, and the tender result I think we we'll see you soon, is for Scotland, where there is both uh, fault current contribution as well as inertia required. Uh, again, it's, uh, it, this uh, fault current is very important for national grid. Now, this, in this tender, they also opened up for these uh, power electronics devices. Uh, which is, I call uh, grid forming devices. And that's a, a way to, to at least uh, open up, uh, to be open for other type of solutions than uh, rotating machines. But I think the majority of that project, uh, Pathfinder 2, will also be rotating machines. Uh, and Pathfinder 3, which will come in, in England and Wales uh, later this year, where we also will expect uh, fault current contribution and inertia, which will be purchased by national grid from uh, ancillary service providers uh, quoting uh, for that project. Now, this was this uh, synchronous condenser package, which we are now uh, just now commissioning in the, in the Liverpool area, in Lister Drive, uh, where we provide, uh, ABB provide two synchronous condenser systems, which totally delivers about 460 megawatt seconds of uh, inertia. Now, uh, you can, understand that it's, uh, the British system is running with about 200, 250 uh, gigawatt uh, seconds. So this means in reality that with these two uh, systems, we are providing about 0.5% uh, ish uh, of, the, of the inertia, which is uh, used in, uh, in, in UK. And uh, we are also provide, of course, the, the need, the requirement for auxiliary power systems for synchronous consensus, the SCADA systems and the, and the connection up to the step up transformer to the national grid's uh, 400 kV substation. Uh, and uh, on the right hand picture there, you see the, 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 the tests in our workshop uh, in, in Sweden, uh, we, uh, where we produce the synchronous condenser as well as the flywheel. Uh, which is the big units. The blue part is the pony motor, for, which is used for the startup, as I mentioned. And this yellow parts are the couplings in between, so that we have one mechanical string. Uh, and that was the, the, the run-up test of the rotating uh, string, so that we could uh, show the measure the inertia, as well as uh, the, the run-up time for that installation. In Australia, uh, uh, well, shortly there, they have the situation that they have decided to have renewable energy zones, uh, where we national grid in, in, in UK, we had this uh, ancillary service providers which could act wherever in the grid. Here in, in Australia, they have these zones, these green zones, and within these green zones, the transmission system operators responsible, but outside of those zones, uh, that the developer of renewable must bring their own inertia and fault co current contribution. That means synchronous machines. Uh, so it's a, a little bit different way of approach, 
uh, how to secure and, and get the, 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 the ancillary services like inertia and fault current contribution and the MBRs. Uh, this is a picture uh, where uh, from Darlington Point, it's uh, from a, a British uh, developer, uh, Octopus, uh, who is uh, uh, developing uh, these renewable projects in, uh, in uh, Australia. And there we delivered two synchronous condenser. Uh, in this case, it was uh, air-cooled machines providing fault current and uh, MBRs and inertia to the grid. Uh, in Spain, uh, there, uh, they have a different approach. Uh, there, they look on the, uh, on the whole network and there we, they can see that in some nodes or points where you are connecting to the grid, the renewable uh, generation, these grids are very weak. And they define that, okay, at that point, like let's say a substation called Abandon, uh, there the fault current is such high, this means that you need additionally uh, uh, fault current, and this should be provided by the developer for the renewable plants. Otherwise, you are not allowed to connect anymore. So it's uh, also another way to, to, to approaching and to get this uh, fault current contribution and inertia to the grid. But in general, you can say that the following statement is very much true. If you have more decentralized power generation, that means solar, uh, wind. This means also that you have a decentralized power system approach where you have also this uh, ancillary system support like inertia and fault current, as well as voltage variation, which was also before a very decentralized service. Uh, and this type of service is good if they are also decentralized. I would also add there, uh, if we take the example of the bad situation going on in Ukraine, uh, where uh, big power plants are closed down by, by the aggressor. Uh, and of course, a, a decentralized power system there would also be helping to have a more secure power supply rather than a, a centralized power system where you have only big power plants, like nuclear power plant, which is the case in, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. So what is ABB doing? Well, as ABB is known as a product supplier as well as a subsystem supplier where we are providing the synchronous condensers in packages. Uh, and we can also integrate those even to, the, to a plant level together with uh, uh, SCADA systems and all the medium voltage and low voltage auxiliary power supplies, uh, transformers, if you like, so uh, needed. So we try to make packages and it's more the question of where the customer would like to have his complexity uh, rather than uh, ABP's capability to provide uh, the system. Of course, uh, if you all remember that ABP was also before doing uh, power grids, uh, now this power grid substation type business, uh, transformer business, this is now not anymore ABP. This is, as you know, Hitachi Energy, and this is separated. But uh, today, ABP has the, the freedom of choice where we can work together with those people or do that uh, with uh, other parties or EPC contractors or uh, other suppliers. But in general, I would say a synchronous condenser package is a typical package where you work in subsystems or plant system level, you, you don't buy that on the product level uh, because it's a system support which is uh, required. And for that, you need to understand that how the, the, the unit is providing and supporting the system. Now, uh, a typical example, you have shown some pictures before. This is the synchronous condenser. In this case, it's a synchronous condenser with a flywheel in the middle and the pony motor on the right hand side and the big synchronous condenser is the blue thing there. Uh, and in this case, it's water cooled where we are having pumping units pumping for the cooling of the machine. And of course, as we are rotating machine, we need a lubrication system for the, for the, for the bearings, uh, which of course need to be uh, 
uh, supplied with the power supply and auxiliary power. And of course, uh, the pony motor for this to run up the machine, we need a frequency drive and we need control and protection functionality, uh, which is of course in our control panels and protection panel, which is a part of, a, for example, an e-house, uh, which is here sketched here. And this could be a, a typical package uh, from ABB uh, connected via a transformer to a grid. Here you have the pictures again. This is a smaller unit in, uh, in Australia, a rotating machine on the left hand side, the condenser with the permanent magnet generator on the most left side. And you see the, the cooling types going down uh, to the cooling pump unit and the fin fan coolers above it uh, for cooling of the machine. And this is mainly for, for when you are running the machine with different type of reactive power. For the fault current contribution in reality, it's only the, the, the um, no load losses which are uh, there from the machine. Uh, in, the, in the right -hand middle picture, you see the, the main terminal box where you have the CTs and VTs, the cable connection, uh, search protection like search arrestors and search caps. And then you have the pony motor and this with this yellow, uh, with the coupling and the coupling guard to protect so that you don't uh, come with your fingers in rotating parts. And then on the right hand side, you have again the pony motor and then the lube oil system with the lube oil tank providing the lubrication of the, of the, of the beer rings. Uh, a number of references that just to give you a, a feeling which size don't we speak about. Well, the, here you, it's a 60 MBR machine providing about 100 megawatt seconds in inertia. It's about the machine and the pony motor, it's maybe about six, seven meters long. Uh, you see the, 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 the cooling system is using more space than really with the pumping unit and the, the synchronous condenser itself. So if, uh, if you have a, a noise requirement, normally a water cooling system is better. If you have uh, no noise restrictions, then of course the air cooling system would be very nice because uh, then you have uh, much less space requirements uh, and you can make it more, much, much more compact. Like in this case here, you have these two units uh, air cooled and it's only the air cooled unit uh, and uh, the, the container for the, 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 the drive and the medium voltage and low voltage auxiliary power supply, which is the, taking quite the, also a lot of space. And of course, the, the step up transformer. <clears throat> now here are a few pictures. Of course, you can have that also installed indoor. We normally recommend that, for example, in Scotland, if you have a farmhouse building or something, some protection. Uh, in, in reality, the machines can stand outdoors. It's no problem for that. But uh, if you have a winter climate or if you have to make uh, services, sometimes it's nice if you don't need to take away a one meter of snow. Uh, so in this case, for example, it was in Canada for Hydro Quebec, one of the big utilities there where we installed the synchronous condenser in-house. Uh, in this case, it was again a water-cooled machine. Um, another project uh, in Australia where we use the, the cold air to cool down also the machine. It's a little bit a special cooling system, but there are different types of cooling systems depending a little bit on the, on the customer requirements on the environmental conditions where we try to, to select the right uh, cooling system for the machine. Now to the specialities of high inertia. Uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, inertia, it will, it's uh, becoming a very important po point. And of course, one way of, of doing it is, this would be a, a big two pole machine, which may be a, a two times the length of that, what you see here. Uh, of course, then you could get with the higher speed and the, 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 the weight of the two pole machine rotor, you can also get a quite high amount of inertia. But uh, we have seen more and more that the, the, when you have a big machine, you have also high losses. Uh, if you can get the same amount of inertia with a smaller machine, uh, 
and adding on a mechanical flywheel to that, as you show here in the middle, then you can provide with lower losses the same amount of inertia. And that was exactly the case what we did in Lister Drive, where we provided two of those setups for the Lister Drive StartCraft Drive project. And it's a good way because you are reducing also the losses of the, of the installation. Uh, and that's, I think, uh, it's very important because losses in reality, it ends up also in CO2 emissions, isn't it? Another way how we are seeing that now more and more, we are using multiple units uh, connected. In this case here, we get via, via a three winding transformer where we have one uh, synchronous machine on each uh, leg of the three winding transformer. But in reality, Today, uh, we could also go and connect two of synchronous machi machines to one leg of a three winding transformer so that you could have just one step up transformer and four machines connected. And this is be because we have a, a special solution of limiting the fault currents in down to our machine and to allow a higher fault current down to our machine, uh, which is then uh, required to, to do this type of solutions. Another project which was installed in uh, in uh, uh, in the Phoenix project in in uh, in UK uh, with uh, Scot uh, Scottish Power. Uh, this was a, a project which we did uh, together with our colleagues from Power Grids, where they delivered a Startcom solution, which was connected to one leg of a synchronous content of of a three winding transformer, and the synchronous condenser was on the on the on the other leg. Uh, and the idea of that was to combine and to test the technologies, how they can work together. So in reality, this could be, it could be on the left-hand side, it could be a battery storage system, or it could be a, a HVTC link, or it could be, as in this case, a, a, a Startcom solution. Uh, and on the right side, how they can then work together with a synchronous contender. Uh, the advantage is that the synchronous condenser will provide, of course, the fault current and, and the, the, uh, the response when you have a fault and the voltage dip in the grid. And the synchronous and the Startcom is then providing active filtering uh, and also the, the uh, post fault uh, uh, voltage control, because for that, uh, Startcom is quite a uh, uh, nice solution where the synchronous condenser maybe create a kind of over voltage after the fault, the, the, the start comb would help to limit that. And this was installed in, in Nettlestone in, in UK. And uh, uh, on those pictures you see on the right hand side, uh, the big building is the start comb building where you also need those, uh, some filters and the li line reactors on front of the building. And then the, the smaller area uh, building on the, in the middle of the, of the picture on the right hand side. This is a synchronous condenser. And if you remember, the size of the synchronous condenser was about the same as the start, the start cone. So uh, that means in reality, here you can really see that a synchronous condenser is very compact. The only thing which is now in the big building, uh, which is related to the synchronous condenser is our uh, protection and control control panel, as well as the frequency drive. But this is a, a minor uh, part of that uh, building. So uh, synchronous condensers is a very compact way of building uh, this uh, type of grid support uh, uh, solutions. So I think uh, I will uh, end up with a two, two, three more slides. Uh, the summary, synchronous condensers are there to supporting the grid with short circuit capacity, providing rotating mass for frequency control, uh, helping you in the voltage control with dynamic MVRs. We have the nice situation that we have a high terminal overload capacity uh, for these machines. If you compare that with power electronics where you don't have any overload, uh, terminal overload capacity at all, uh, and then also the, the ride-through capability of a rotating machine is uh, is uh, very good because it's uh, and support in with that 
it's also supporting the, the power electronics, especially the renewable energy in a, in a good way. Uh, another thing, it's a reborn technology. It's nothing new, really. We have used these technologies in the 50s for voltage regulation. Now we are coming back with additional services, a little bit more optimized, a little, a little bit more efficient, as we are working very much on the efficiency of the machines, of the rotating machines nowadays, because of this dual two emission issue. Uh, another important thing is that it's more and more important to simulate. So there are the requirements of machines to simulate them uh, in, in models. Uh, and there are two different types of models. One model is based on RMS values. This means uh, the, the, uh, where you do your power flows studies, where you do your short circuit current studies. And this is typical Dix Island power factory, PSSE. These are these RMS based uh, models. Uh, and of course, there, the rotating machine is a standard component there, but the, 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 our voltage control unit, the AVR, uh, automatic voltage uh, regulator, needs to be modelized and, and, and uh, uh, modeled. And these are, can be done with this PSSE model and power factory models. And PSCAT, this is a kind of EMT model, which is used on transient uh, applications for transient measurements. If you have count interaction between control system, for example. And there, uh, this is of course important uh, to provide these type of models. And ABB is doing that, not only to our partners, but also to uh, the transmission system operators, which finally are the ones which have to decide which type of solution they need to, to uh, apply so that the system is stable. Uh, here again, uh, this uh, uh, yeah, differences of this, uh, the models and the models which we have available uh, for that. Uh, both black box models as well as open box models for, for transmission system operators. And then another short uh, point, I said to you in the beginning that sometimes you want to change uh, existing synchronous machine from a synchronous generator to a synchronous condenser, which in general can be done. But I always say that, please start with your homework. Please start with this life expectancy analyze of your insulation system of the generator, because otherwise it's getting very uh, expensive. Because if the state of winding insulation is not good enough, the costs are running away. And there was some big scandals uh, where, where uh, for example, in, in Biblis in Germany, where they tried to use a nuclear power generator uh, and, and uh, converted that into a, a synchronous condenser. It was first a political scandal, and then after five years' time, they closed it down because it was econ econ economically not feasible to run these big machines uh, more or less uh, uh, on, on no load conditions. So it's, uh, it's very important to make this leap analysis in the beginning and after that, check up how feasible is it to connect uh, at the existing point. Can you, can you use, use these big machines? Is, are these losses of these big machines are not too big? This is not better to use a, a optimized synchronous condenser. But it's, sometimes it is worthwhile to go for that, especially when, when you want to uh, connect at an existing power connection point, because otherwise it's get also tricky to build a new new site, and this is can take years to to get the allowance and the approvals for uh, different type of connection agreements. So sometimes it's worthwhile to think to connect uh, synchronous condensers via existing uh, infrastructures, you can say, <laughs> or connection infrastructure. We are everywhere not only in UK and supporting our partners. And that was my presentation. So I stopped my presentation sharing here. So Mike, uh, if we could take up, uh, and if you come in and we take up the questions. Hold on, I'll unmute and I will start my video. Thank you very much, Christian. We've got a large number of questions, so we'll uh, 
try and go fa uh, fairly rapidly through them. I'm going to take them from the top, although some of the later questions may uh, you may be able to say, well, we've answered that already. So it, yeah. it just makes life easier that way. So the first question that we've got is uh, from Andrew. What is the range of inertia in a, a KGM squared available from the synchronous condensers? Uh, we normally, this KGM square value, uh, it's, if you look on the, on the big machine, the AMS uh, 1400, which we show, it was about in the, in the roughly 8,600 kilogram meter square value. Now, this kilogram meter square value is only give you a, an idea if you know the speed of the machine and with that you know the age factor of a machine. So that's the reason why I, I more speak about the megawatt second value rather than the kilogram meter square value. Uh, because then you must calculate with the speed and you must calculate uh, with, the, with the age factor, which can differ if you run on different type of speeds. Okay, I, I should have perhaps uh, uh, coupled this question. It's also from Andrew. What is the typical efficiency of a uh, synchronous condenser, SC? Yeah, normally a synchronous condenser, they have the, it's, it's difficult to speak about efficiency because you are really, uh, buying a kind of insurance company for providing grid support. But if you, like, if you like to use efficiency, normally we speak about one and a half percent of, uh, of, the, of the ratio of the machine where you have the losses. Uh, we try to, to reduce that, but it's in, in the range of one and a half percent and up to between one and one and a half percent. Okay, thank you. And then we move on to uh, Chris. And he says, and this is an interesting piece of history. I did, he says, he did his uh, initial engineering tra training in 1969 at Fulham Power Station. And uh, there they used um, synchronous compensation using a 60 megawatt set with about 10 megawatts of steam to compensate for the excessive voltages on the grid network. And do these machines, synchronous condensers, do the same thing? Well, in reality, what you did there with this uh, steam, it was in reality kind of generator. It was a synchronous machine, and of course, uh, it had a, it had a kind of driver, a steam turbine, you can say, which provided you and you use this steam to provide reactive power and voltage regulation and fault current and inertia. Now, uh, in, in a synchronous condenser today, we don't need the steam turbine. We are just running up the machine and connecting it to the grid. And once it's connected, then we can provide the services of inertia and uh, MVRs for voltage regulation or the default current. So it's uh, very much the same, but uh, a little bit new approach. Uh, and, and, and you still see these old machines running. Good. Uh, there's another steam question later on, but I, I'll, I'll take them in order. And the next question from Colin Ireland, uh, what energy is used for the pony motor? How does that affect efficiency and emissions? Yeah, what we do normally is that this pony motor is designed to the speed, how quick we have to run up the machine. Now, there are different customers may have different ideas. Not in, in this case for Lister Dryer, for example, where we have a, 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 a big machine with a flywheel and we want to run up that machine in 15 minutes. We, we have a, about a, a machine which is uh, providing roughly two megawatts for 15, for 15 minutes. And after this 15 minutes, we are then connected to the grid and synchronized to the grid. And then we are disconnecting, you can say the, the electrical uh, connection of the pony motor. So that pony motor is running idle together with the synchronous machine. Uh, and uh, we use this, uh, the drive only then again, if we would like to slow down the machine and have an emergency stop. But in general, uh, only during these 15 minutes, we use this pony motor and the drive of a size of roughly two megawatts for starting up this, uh, this uh, synchronous condenser as we had it in the list of drive. Okay. And if you allow for 
longer startup times, then you could reduce those value maybe down to even less than one megawatt. Okay. Our next question is from Jiraj Katkar. And the what is the maximum capacity uh, SC available with ABB? So there you are. Well, when you speak about capacity, uh, the, the issue is that, as I said, you have to think about three things in the same time. One is the inertia, and the inertia, of course, it's uh, one type of capacity. Now, our biggest machine as a single machine could provide you a 100 megawatt seconds of inertia. Uh, and this same machine would provide you also maybe a 60 MVR uh, uh, compensator which provides a reactive power for 60 MVR and would provide you a fault current at the terminals which is maybe uh, 400 ish uh, MVA on fault fault level now uh, of course when we can go down the line can add on additionally a flywheel and then you have 460 megawatts of, of inertia but with the same type of fault current contribution and maybe with the same type of MVRs. But uh, for example, we have now this, this project in, in Spain where inertia is not required. So that means in reality, we have there only a machine which provides you a fault current of, of roughly 400 MVA on the machine, but the machine itself, it's only 15 MVA, MVRs. Uh, so it's a very small machine providing the fault current. So it's, it's also this question, what is the requirements and how shall we dimension and handle this different type of components to provide these type of services? Okay. And the next question is from Adam Rowan. What is the expected asset life and maintenance frequency of these synchronous compensators? Yeah, Re regarding lifetime, I think uh, your Mike's speech uh, about one of this project is telling you that those machines are running from the 50s to now. So the lifetime expectation of the rotating machine is very long. We speak normally about 25, 30, even more than that years. Now, uh, the, you will have most likely more problems with the power, with the, with the power electronics and the relay protection schemes uh, and, the, and the SCADA system, which you have to renew much more often than the rotating machine itself. Uh, when it comes to serviceability of the machine, uh, the, the, of course, it's a rotating machine and it needs service. So normally we speak about one to two days uh, per machine uh, as a, as a uh, offline where we have to, to, to check the machine and to, to uh, check the bearing, the, 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 the auxiliary systems which we have uh, during the first years to come. Up, up when we are in the year 12 ish somewhere, uh, we then make a rotor inspection, which is also today, it standard takes about a week to take out the rotor and to crawl in and to inspect the insulation system. It takes a little bit longer time, but then it's, uh, it's between 12 and 15 years. Uh, you also have to know that we are adding today a lot more monitoring systems in those uh, uh, deliveries, which means that we can monitor temperature, the oil system, uh, the, the vibrations, so that we are really supervising the, 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 the animal in a good way. And with that also, we can increase the, the and decrease the, the stop times for this uh, applications. Okay, another question from Diraj Katkar, and that is at a certain point of, of connection with the grid, uh, if given a choice uh, to select SC and the STATCOM, what would be the cost difference? They both save the say, serve the same purpose except inertia, which you get from the SC. Yeah, I would say there are there are two. To, to correct one thing, uh, statcoms cannot provide fault current. So uh, both inertia and fault current is the unique services by the synchronous condenser. But when it comes to MVRs and reactive power, I agree with you, a statcom can provide reactive power at least after the fault, like they, as I said, post fault action. During the fault itself, when you get a fault and the voltage dip, 
the, the synchronous condenser is there, it's a current source and is providing the help automatically at, at once. So uh, also there, a synchronous condenser is special. But when it comes to this commercial point, uh, uh, the, the synchronous condenser in comparison with a stop comb of the same size like we had in Snilestone, I would assume that the, the price for the stop comb was two and a half, three times the price of a synchronous condenser. Well, there you are. <laughs> All right. Um, Colin, uh, sorry, Corin Island. Uh, have they been uh, thought about, presumably SCs, but, uh, by, uh, for being used in Black Start restoration scenarios? Yes. This is a, it's a becoming up a more and more important thing. And, and uh, we have seen more and more uh, uh, reports where a combination of synchronous condenser and battery systems and battery converters, uh, especially when they are using grid forming inverters, uh, can be combined in a very good manner where the grid forming battery systems can use and ha handle the black start capability and the synchronous condenser provide the fault current and the, the, sub, the you can say the, the strengths needed when you want to uh, restart up a system. Uh, we have, other, if you only want to do the black start capability with a synchronous condenser, we would need a title generator set uh, to, to start that up. But, but it's also possible to do that. But uh, in, in today, there are much more discussion going on with this battery storage and grid forming inverter capabilities combining with their synchronous condenser, because then you get, uh, you can say, you can really become uh, independent from uh, these uh, dial, uh, dial generators and, and, uh, and uh, CO2 emit emitting uh, technologies. Okay, then uh, the next question is from Tim Guy. I take it that SCs hold energy if the grid trips, and are there any safety implications with this, i.e. during repairs, etc.? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, when we had the, the first uh, project for Lister Drive, we had uh, one of the critical issues, of course, is if you lose the grid and if you lose the whole auxiliary power supply. And, uh, and, and you can imagine, well, the reason behind that of the criticality of this uh, is that the, B, the, 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 the lubrication system must still run. So there, you need some power providing you with some uh, power to provide the pumps, bringing the lubrication to the bearings, because otherwise you could theoretically create a problem on the bearings and they run hot, and then you could get a, a problem on the, on the big uh, uh, animal, you can say. So there it was a lot of work how to, to create a, a system where we have uh, uh, auxiliary powers available for that. In reality, theoretically, you could say that, well, uh, if we make a, a little bit more automation on top of that, we could use our own rotating masses also in generating with the permanent magnet generator and the drive system, our own auxiliary power. And with this auxiliary power, we always can run down safely our, our machine. So uh, uh, in, in that respect, uh, there are possibilities to, to develop that and to, 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 to advance that. But it's, uh, as I said, it's a critical thing to think about this inertia, uh, how to protect that inertia. Uh, I can mention to you that um, theoretically, those big flywheels which we are using, theoretically, this could they could damage inside. You could get cracks, maybe not today, but maybe after 15 years of operation. And then, of course, these cracks could create a, a problem and they could just fly away, which is, of course, we don't want to have that uh, flying around in, in Liverpool. So uh, we created a kind of a protection for this uh, case where we could, could get a fault, which is normally not there, but it's at least where we have a protection about that to secure that this is captured. Now, in the next generation of flywheels, we have that already enclosed inside of the flywheel itself by using a kind of stator arrangement, protecting this inertia to keep in, in place. 
And then the, regarding auxiliary power systems and lubrication, we have these uh, emergency tanks providing the, the oil for the lubrication systems. So uh, we have uh, uh, more developments coming up there uh, for a more secure uh, synchronous condenser. I'm going to uh, try and um, relay a question from further down the list, which I, I'm not looking at at the moment, just using my memory. And that is, can you make flywheels out of concrete to make them cheaper and cast them, cast them on site? Uh, I think I think a steel arrangement is quite nice. Uh, if you if you would make to do it uh, with concrete, uh, concrete it's a quite tricky thing uh, because you are then. It's an uh, environmental issue if you have uh, salt water and uh, other issues, you have, uh, you have to do this in a good way. So we thought a, a, a steel arrangement is a, a nice solution for a flyweight. On the, se the second issue is also that we have to think about uh, sustainability. And uh, once upon a time, maybe not tomorrow, but maybe after 40 years, we take away that flywheel and then we can smelt it down in one of the arc furnaces nearby, and you can recycle it to something else. For concrete, it's not as simple. You have, uh, you're creating uh, another issue. Okay, right. Then we have a question from Mike Sims. And uh, again, using my memory on the chat, uh, Mike Sims said he's also in Spain. Uh, so at the moment, so uh, I don't know if he's near you or not. He doesn't say, but anyway, his question is, do synchronous condensers make noise? Maybe they need cooling with fans uh, from the environmental planning point of view. So if SCs were, uh, particularly if, if SCs were to be installed nearer houses, would, is that an issue? Yes, of course, you have to think about that. Uh, that's the reason why I mentioned that there is different type of cooling systems, which has more or less noise impact. But in, in all cases, a rotating machine is creating noise. Uh, by the way, also a stopcom is creating a noise because uh, the line reactors, the reactors are creating noise as the harmonics pass by. So it's also there. But uh, in the worst cases, we have to build in a kind of enclosure to protect against uh, noise, noise uh, protections, uh, which is possible to do. Uh, as I said, we have done this uh, indoor arrangements for this uh, tougher environmental climate situation. It, it's it's a, a noise protection as well. Okay, uh, next question from Tim Guy. Will there be any additional cost uh, as there is, um, I'm not t technically in the area, but as with excess spinning in inertia, there is a, he says there's, a government taxation, I believe. Is that is there some taxation on that or? Uh, no, I don't know what what, what means with taxation. Normally, uh, a spinning inertia itself is functionality, uh, which is wanted. Uh, so I, I cannot relate that to a kind of taxation. Uh, I would assume that in some cases. Uh, in some countries, uh, when customers are connecting to the grid, they are now they are requiring or delivering reactive power, and this reactive power exchange is today already a taxation issue because today uh, reactive power must be produced somewhere also, uh, and uh, means in reality that you have to pay for that reactive power as well, which is a kind of uh, taxation. If I understand the question correct okay then there's from uh, Gihan Abeya Wadeni uh, and he says good evening Christian what is the uh, largest MVAR rating of a synchronous condenser plus or minus reactive capability that has been commissioned to date you needn't necessarily speak about a ABB well, well, uh, when you speak about ABB, then our size it's roughly rough 70, 80 MBRs. It depends, of course, on the environmental conditions, on the temperatures and the cooling possibilities. Uh, this was it's the biggest range. In, in, in UK, we are using machines up to 67, 70 MBRs. 
Now, uh, in, in relation to other uh, suppliers, we are relatively small. Of course, there are machines available up to 300, 400, 500 MVRs. Uh, but then the question is, is that amount, big amount of MVRs requested uh, at that point of the grid? Uh, so it's, uh, yeah. So, so we are, we are, we are delivering the, the, the small, the big small animals where there are supplies available who can pr deliver very big machines uh, providing a big amount of uh, MVRs and, uh, and uh, fault level, but may not necessarily inertia because uh, those big machines are using another type of, uh, cil they have cylindrical uh, rotors, which is very little inertia on those. So in, in our machines, we have salient pole machines, which is, are very good from uh, inertia point of view. Right. Um, th there's this uh, message just come up from Tim uh, Guy. I, I can't, but but there there was a case of of taxation which came up uh, on on the previous question uh, raised. But but I, I can't I can't speak to it. I'm just saying he says there was a case. Let's get back to Gihan because he has a sec. He or she. I'm not sure which it is. Uh, he, uh, has a. Uh, um, a second question, without the turbine train, the actual inertia of the spinning mass is smaller. So when compared to a traditional steam turbine generator or gas turbine generator arrangement, how does the inertia constant compare? Yeah, uh, that's the reason why I don't use the inertia constant. In reality, if I, if I would give an inertia constant of our machines, that would be roughly one, an age factor of one. But as I said, and if you if you look compare that to a steam turbine or hydropower plant or a, where you have have age constants of two up to five, depending on which type of uh, generation it is, of course those age constants are higher. But as I mentioned to you before, for us the important thing is to not the age constant, because. Uh, we try to, to create the megawatt seconds value, which is the important thing, uh, which is the, the thing which is important for national grid to, to counteract frequency variations. It's not the H factor which is doing that. Uh, and it's not either the, the kilogram uh, meter square value. It's the megawatt seconds values which are important. And, and there uh, for, for the synchronous condenser from us, we have these values of 460 megawatt seconds for one machine with a flywheel, which we would compare to a 300 MBR uh, machine when it's uh, a, a generator, a normal a synchronous generator. Okay, now we're gonna we're running out of time, but there's still some interesting questions. <laughs> and so if you can sort of give a, or not quite yes no, but uh, yeah, yeah, but a short Shorter. answer to that. Um, and I think you may have already answered this one. Uh, from Doug, what is the typical efficiency of a synchronous condenser, e.g. what percentage is used by the continuous running of the pony, po pony motor? Is the simple figure? I, I said this 2% and I said this ratings of a, the biggest pony motor for the big machine was about 1 to 2 megawatts. Okay, thank you. Uh, cooling implies energy consumed by the SC system. Do you have figures for this? Uh, yes, uh, there, there are of course the, the most of the cooling issues related to the, uh, I would say, the, the, the no load losses, which is a, for a, a 70 MVR machine, roughly uh, 500 to 700 uh, kilowatts, which is, uh, as I said to, to you, this one, one and a half percentage ish. And those needs to, to be cooled away. Uh, of course, when you provide MVRs, uh, then they, they, they increase the losses because then we are changed the excitation and the magnetization of the system, and then it may go up to, um, let's say, uh, one megawatt of a, a 70 uh, MVR machine. Okay. Uh, that question, by the way, I forgot to say, was from Anthony, Anthony Cutler. There's an anonymous attendee who asks, could an open cycle gas turbine be used as a sink uh, cond? Synchronous. Of uh, I would say it would be a synchronous condenser if you disconnect the, the turbine 
and uh, and uh, rebuilds the synchronous condenser in a way that you are running up the machine somehow with a medium voltage drive or a pony motor and use just the synchronous generator as a condenser. If you use the, the turbine, then it's, well, of course, then you could run it as a synchronous condenser, but then you would also need somebody who is, who is feeding the energy to the turbine, which means that you need the fuel, uh, which you have to pay for. Okay. Um, the next question was from Mike Waldridge, and that was the one about concrete. I think you've answered that. Uh, next one after that is Syed Ahmed. What is the expected fault, fault current support duty cycle, faults per year, in other words, and magnitude uh, brackets PU? Yeah, when it comes to, to this, uh, how often this fault current is provided, well, it's, we, we cannot control that. It's, of course, it depends if there is a fault. Uh, when it comes to fault current in, in per unit, you can say that the per unit value is between five and six per unit. Uh, based on the rated uh, uh, current of the machine. So, uh, and then of course you have a, a, a peak value and you have this uh, uh, subtransient value and transient value and reactance value which decline as I showed in one of those diagrams. Okay. Um, next question quickly from Mohan. Can retiring generators be modified to perform similar function as a synchronous condenser? Yes, but do your homework first. That means check, check your leap analyzer. And, and okay, the answer is yes. Okay, Mike Waldridge again. What is an uh, optimum ratio of uh, uh, of capacity for SC uh, uh, capacity for say an all solar and wind supplied network? Uh, th that's not an. Not, not, not so simple question because of course you would like to have a, a big inertia as possible. It's always good for the, for the, for the grid. Uh, on the other side, for high fault current, it's maybe not nice for the renewable plants because then the switch gear at their end will get in more costly. So, uh, so they would rather like to have that somewhere else. So it's not, it's also a kind of trade off a little bit. So which we have to design to each and every project uh, so it's unfortunately no, no better answer than that. Right. Um, next one from Gihan. What are your views on synthetic inertia from high voltage DC links? Does it really deliver in comparison to SCs? Yeah. Uh, first of all, there are not so many which are doing that yet. 95% uh, of our power electronics have no grid forming capabilities. This means that uh, it's a it's a theoretical animal. Of course, synchronous uh, inertia helps. Uh, it's good, but it's not uh, real inertia, which means that you have to measure, uh, you have to have uh, how that, you have to measure that somehow to secure that you will really get uh, the, 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 the response you would re require. Uh, you could very easily come to the point where the frequency you measure it just in the moment, in the time window you are doing the measurement is a over frequency and then you would counteract in a completely com wrong way. So that's the reason why uh, uh, instantaneous inertia or real inertia is the ones which is preferred. But synchronic, uh, synthetic inertia, it's okay if you wait 400, 500 milliseconds and then do your actions, then you can get uh, a, an inertial response which is uh, feasible. Okay, next one is a bit long, so we, I, I will, um, it's from Matthew, Matthew Mormon. Um, he asked you to explain a bit more why you uh, used a SVC in a synchronous condenser other than filtering, they're both supplying VARs, so why both? Have you combined energy storage so the SVC uh, can contribute MW when frequency depth? So I guess, is there a... Uh, I guess synthetic inertia. So I, I think you've probably partly answered that question. Have yes, you? I think I think so. I, I, SVC maybe it's maybe to clarify that it's static bar compensator. It's not a statcom. SVCs are normally filter banks and a, a controlled reactor, which in reality are also dynamic and VRs. But it's not. Uh, you cannot compare that to functionalities of a synchronous condenser. Uh, 
uh, which is inertia and fault current contribution, which you cannot do, and you cannot do with an SVC system, and or, or by the way, a Statcom system. Okay. Uh, there's a question for URLs for slide case studies. This is being recorded, so I, I, I think uh, we'll move on from that, unless you want to say something on that. That was uh, then Shafu, uh, Ahmed Shafu, uh, can synchronous condensers slip poles? Uh, in reality, th theoretically, yes, practically no, uh, because there is no generator on turbine connected to that which is create, would create a kind of slip because this, the machine is always in, in synchronization with the grid itself. But there are situations, theoretical situations where you could have a synchronous condenser long way down the line somewhere and where the grid itself and the whole grid where the synchronous condenser or maybe a, a, a renewable energy park is connected slip from the rest of the grid. And of course, then of course, the synchronous condenser can also see that slip. But in general, synchronous condensers do not have a, 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 a pole slip. Right. Uh, there's one question which may have to be the the last question, which is I hope the, um, the first, let's find, I'll just move past it to count how many more questions there, there were. There are a few more. Uh, but Christoph Bednarz asks. And you may not want to, or you may want to give him your card so that he can buy one. What is the approximate cost of these units, for example, per meg, uh, MVAR? Ah, this is a tricky, this is a tr tr very tricky question uh, because this is stepwise arranged. And again, you must ask the question what is it, gen just the MVRs, or do you buy the inertia and fault level as well? Uh, I would think uh, that I can provide you a kind of rough figure, uh, but then I would do that rather in any communication with him. Uh, so it's, uh, if not, Stephen could say a word for this project in uh, in, in Lister Drive, uh, where, where where you you have. For, I think it was was it. Uh, um, I don't, I don't remember the value for the list arrive project in, for Statcraft in total, the total investment. Yeah, uh, hi, Christian. Yeah, I mean, uh, all I would comment on that is uh, just a quick Google search and, you, and you'll see that uh, there is a value given for the whole solution. Um, and uh, along with that for, for phase one, National Grid also published um, the, uh, the return that, um, that 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 Statcraft will get for um, for the uh, for providing the service. So, um, um, but but that is publicly available. But I, I, I yeah, it, it's a tricky question because are we just talking about supplying the system, as in the synchronous condenser and the cooling loop system? Are we talking about um, system and install? Are we talking about the civils? Uh, and land and everything else, uh, almost delivering it as a turnkey. And, and there, um, th th there is a, a very wide scope of pricing. Um, and of course, we haven't touched on the fact that with for National Grid, there is an expectation of availability. And that, of course, um, carries a, a, a cost in delivering that as well. Because um, there's no, no point in having a, something that provides a service um, that is, is not reliable. So uh, I, hope, I hope I've dodged the bullet there, Christian. <laughs> Perfect, Stephen. Thank you. Okay, so, well, well done, Stephen. So uh, contact the ABB and then and try and... Absolutely, them. absolutely. Yeah. I, I will say, I can, <laughs> I, can tell, I can tell one thing. I would not buy one and have it in my garden. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Right, there are one question. I'm going to just read them out, and if you like to pick one from it, what is the additional cost of running these systems? Any thumb values for standard ratings? What's one question? Does ABBSC have a round rotor, or is it a salient uh, pole machine? And what is a Didal generator PLS? So, do you want to pick out any one of those? Uh, sa salient, salient pole machine is ABB solution. Uh, regarding the, the, the losses, I think also there, it's what are you calculating? 
what are we including? I think uh, I cannot give a good, nice picture on that. And the third question, I could, I just, just didn't understand. But it's. I, I think that was just a, a misunderstanding. That I think you were talking about diesel generators as as a backup solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, okay, uh, yeah, yeah. for the uh, for, for where we have a synchronous condenser with a flywheel, because we have a uh, effectively potentially a, a seven hour rundown. So if you lost power, uh, it would take s uh, around seven hours to come to rest. So during that seven hour period, we've got to make sure the bearings are lubricated. Uh, unless uh, if we have a grid connection, we can use the, uh, the pony motor and, and regen drive to, to bring it to, uh, to a stop in a similar time as it takes to start. So if you have a 15 minute start arrangement, you can bring it to stop in around the same sort of time. Okay, that's answered the question. I think we really there is one more, but uh, let's just see. Um, it's from Rick Charles. It's a. Uh, da, 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 da. Is the high uh, um, is the control system monitoring the voltage at the SC terminals, or the high voltage uh, or the high voltage side of the transformer? Which which side is it? Well, normally we measure the voltage on the on the side of the machine. Okay. Uh, but but it could be applications, for example, where you have industrial applications where you measure on the on other places as well. But in general, we are measuring the voltage on the on the secondary side of the transformer. Okay. Well, I think I must uh, draw it to a close. Thank you very much, Christian, for a really superb talk, and thank you also, Stephen, for acting as a uh, a silent um, but deputy, if you like, for answering questions. And uh, it really was most interesting. The thing that really surprised me was it's such an important area, which normally we never see. And the second part I was amazed at is the amazing, well, I suppose it's not a surprise really, but an amazing geographical scope. So thank you very much for, on behalf of the IET, for the Sussex IET and everybody who, who came along. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kill my microphone and vision and leave the thing on for a few minutes because there are uh, 55 chat things. Now, can uh, uh, Christian, can you see the the chat they're 57 they've just gone up and i'm sure yeah. they're nice they're nice comments to you <laughs> thank you very much do you want to read them yeah i would i would like to read them and have a, have a nice all stream right. well, after that for, for a maximum of five minutes so okay cheers to you all thank you very much for attending and we normally say safe journey home but most of us are at home anyway well safe journey from spain back to, to thank APC. you very much thank you cheers bye, -bye. bye.